Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Samuel McElroy Taylor, director of the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. With diverse collections that include more than 19 million specimens, objects, and artifacts, it is one of the largest museums of natural history in the country. A marine biologist and science educator, Sam Taylor has worked for more than 20 years in advisory and leadership roles at various natural history, museums, and science and technology centers including the California Academy of Sciences, the American Museum of Natural History, and the New York Hall of Science. He generously agreed to share some of his insights with us, and I'd like to thank you, Sam, for joining us today. Thank you very much. So let's talk about the relevance of a bricks and mortar museum in which physical presence is part of the experience as opposed to a internet experience where information is so instantaneously available in a easy to navigate format. And the relevance of this physical experience of the objects and of the natural history of our world juxtaposed against a, a virtual experience. Well, there's a couple things that I think can happen in the real, in the real uh, space of visiting a natural history museum that simply don't happen on the internet. And I'm, a lot of those things we are striving for, we're not, we haven't exactly reached them yet. But some of those things are inherent to the museum visit. One is that visiting a museum is almost inevitably a social experience. More than half of our visitors come as family groups or come as part of school groups. And so the visit is really about the interaction between different members of the visiting group. It's about sharing stories. It's about looking at things and, and you know, asking your, your friends or your family what they think of them. That doesn't happen on the internet, which is largely a solitary experience. So you're experiencing in community. We're experiencing community not only just with the members of the, of the visiting group, but also increasingly interactions with museum staff members. So who are on the exhibit floor, who are you know, interpreting exhibits, not, not so much in a tell the visitors information kind of fashion, but in ask the visitors fashion. What do they think? What do they think's going on here? Do you have any questions that I can answer? And really trying to utilize what we call 21st century skills, where it's audience-centered, not just content-centered. That's one big difference. Another big difference uh, that, that we need to, uh, even though we have 100,000 square feet of exhibitions for people to see, that we're still uh, bringing more and more and more collections so people can see them. Even to be confronted with one wall, this, you know, 10 feet tall and 20 feet wide, completely wallpapered with butterflies, beautiful, beautiful butterflies from all over the world, is an experience that you just can't have on the internet. Now, there might be other ways to navigate on the internet that, that are not possible within the physical space. Sure. But more of your senses are engaged. More of the senses are engaged, but also we can facilitate an experience that is what, you know, what we hope to have happen with our museum visitors, which is one of investigation. The Natural History Museum is, at its heart, a science-based organization. It's a research-based organization. We're all about discovery, and we're about the generation of knowledge. Sadly, a lot of our visitors don't know that. A lot of our visitors think this is where you come when you look at the dinosaurs, you know, right, and, right. and take a look and you go away. So we are building on a strategic plan that we developed about a year ago one of the main themes of this plan is to align the front of the house, that's the public side of the house, with education and exhibitions, to align the front of the house with the back of the house. That's the scientists and the research and the collections. So that the visitor experience is one of discovery. So that the visitor understands that there are 19 million specimens of, of every imaginable kind of natural history artifact and specimen that are constantly in use. They're not, the, the image of the dusty, musty drawers with, that nobody ever looks at is really or outdated. Or the jars that need to be constantly topped up. Uh, well, they do need to, to be constantly topped up. And you know why? Because every time you open them, some more alcohol evaporates. And, and we're constantly you know, loaning out specimens. Scientists are coming to study our collections. Just in the last year alone, over 36,000 specimens were on loans to other scientists for investigation. So we want people to know that. And we want people to understand the reason that we have collections, the significance of them, and how the Museum of Natural History really is a place that's about the future. 
How do you expose the back office to the public? Because that, that in and of, of itself is, is difficult. You can't have thousands of people walking through the, 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 um, the archives. That seems like a pretty uh, sensible thing to say, but, but what would happen if we just did open the door? And in fact, we're doing that now. Um, every weekend, at least one of the scientific departments just has the door open and says, come on in. And curators are there and volunteers are there to show visitors the collection, to answer their questions, to, to see what they're interested in, and to really let them get their hands on the, the, the meat of what we're doing. A lot of people think that all of this stuff is, is nothing more than a record of the past. The Natural History Museum is seen as a, a place that tells you what the, what the world used to be like. We're really trying to turn that around and have the museum be pictured as a place that generates knowledge that informs the future. How do you inform the, the uh, public, the lay public, about the work that you're doing? We do that through our marketing. We do that through the way that we're training our staff to interact with visitors. We're doing that through the way that we construct exhibitions so that they're experiential instead of just, instead of just you know, uh, visual. Um, we're creating an exhibit right now that will open in October that's a children's exhibition, or more appropriately, it's for the first time learner, regardless of age. I think adults will have a great time in it. And it uses the, the uh, device of an alphabet, uh, the ABCs, to teach kids, all the visitors, every single aspect about what a great natural history museum does. The name of the exhibition is M is for Museum. M is for Museum. And so in this exhibition, kids will be able to play researcher, they'll be able to play educator, there'll be hundreds and hundreds of specimens on display, they'll get to create their own collections. It's gonna just completely throw the doors open and let people see what the museum is about. So are you marketing science? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're marketing the scientific process. We're marketing the, the importance of knowledge and the importance of inquiry. And we're really trying to market a new way of interacting with visitors and a new model for science education. And is this approach informed by some of the marketing steps that are taken in the commercial world? I mean, we, we see the marketing of everything from uh, fast food to mm -hmm. clothing to uh, personal products, automobiles, and so on. Is there a distinction between um, marketing that takes place, for example, in the commercial world and marketing that might take place uh, for, for a nonprofit like yours? Well, I think the distinction has to do with our focus on mission. It's been said that the mission of a for-profit venture is to use marketing right, as a way to, to, to raise money. Right. So, you know, if, if you're in a for-profit world, that's how you market success. That's how you measure success. Sell more products. Sell more products and make more money. In a museum, you're mission-driven. Have we educated people? Have we generated knowledge? Have we, have we uh, inspired more scientists? Have we enabled people to feel that they have the capacity to understand nature? Talk a, a, a bit about your management philosophy that attaches to this idea of mission and this idea of, of professional competence, but now in service to a mission. Well, you just asked the $64,000 question. <laughs> We're in the process right now of, of, again, guided by our strategic plan of reorganizing the entire structure of the museum. A traditional natural history museum, which we are certainly one of, has, has departments right. that are organized on the basis of the taxonomy of organisms. So there's a department of birds, and there's a department of mammals, and there's a department of insects, that's not how science is organized anymore, you know, and that's not how, that's not how people experience the world either. It's amazing, even our exhibitions are that, are that siloed. So we have an exhibition of mammals, we have bird hall, we have botany hall, we have the hall of minerals, and yet we don't have even so much as a sentence in the museum that would allow visitors to know that these things interact with one another in this place called outside. So this approach, the approach that, that is more traditional, is almost as if you're stacking shoe boxes up and you, and you, have, a, you have a rock, so you say, okay, that's mineral, and you, you have a fossil, a fossil so you, you put that into another box and you have 
um, some uh, plant material, you put that in. So it might be useful in terms of, of putting stuff in shoe boxes, but then you end up with, with an organization that looks like it's a bunch of shoe boxes. Mindful that we want to be relevant, instead of an organizational structure that describes the stuff that we have, right. that's the shoebox approach. Shoe box approach. We now are moving to an organizational structure that describes the work that we do. So we're, we are reorganizing into five interdisciplinary centers to break down these silos between the front of the house and the back of the house. One of the key features is that educators and scientists work together on projects that have to do with real topics in language that people understand and in ways that, that uh, constantly are, are project-based. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list the five centers for you that our museum will now be known for. The first is the Center for Lifelong Science Learning. So it's not only just doing the public programs, but it's actually doing research on, on the specific way that people learn in these kinds of settings. It's part of a whole ecosystem of informal learning within our community. The second is the Center for Biodiversity and Ecosystems. Uh, the third is the Center for Evolutionary Studies. Fourth is the Center for World Cultures and Diversity, and the Center for Scientific Visualization and Computation. So one important thing about all of the centers, but especially so with the Center for Scientific Visualization, is that these are platforms for collaboration. And so we need partners to work on such things. I'm going to give you the example of uh, one of our scientists, Chris Beard, who's a world-renowned paleontologist, has, um, has taken these very, very small little uh, skulls of early, early anthropoids, all right, which are our ancestors as far back as you can go. They're, they're very small, and he's interested in understanding the brain, uh, you know, the brain capacity of these, but he doesn't want to crack them open because they're really valuable fossils. He takes these to the, um, to the uh, European synchrotron you know, right. research um, facility uh, in Geneva, Switzerland, and using the proton beam to create images of these skulls, just like you would an X-ray, but using protons instead. And they're three-dimensional. They're three-dimensional images. Each, each image contains data at the, literally at the molecular level. But the problem is that these images contain between three to five terabytes of data in each one. Well, we don't have the computer you know, capacity, the, com the computing capacity to even begin to analyze those. So we're working with scientists at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center who are just thrilled to like be able to look at these and go, oh my God, you know, a real problem we can sink our teeth into instead of just you know, the formulas and the number crunching that we're used to. So now you have engineers, mathematicians, paleontologists, artists, all working together yeah. on this problem to advance knowledge. And in a, it, in and of itself, it becomes more knowledge that also needs to be stored. Absolutely. And if you look at all of the collections, the, the data that's associated with each specimen, what it is, where it's from, when it was collected, and then the databases, the digital databases that those are all a part of, that data is, 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 is the real meat of the collection. And yet, without having the tools to be able to explore those, the, the, uh, the geographic information system tools that can say, so a researcher could call us up and say, you know, what is the extent of all of your collections that, that came from the uh, Altai Pamir mountain range in China from 1950 to, uh, to the early 70s? Why would they be asking that question? Who knows? It doesn't matter. You can actually look at them all and you can see what is in natural history collections, but only if you have the ability to dive into those data and really drill down and ask those kind of questions. Now, this, this kind of an organization is going to have a major impact on the museum itself in terms of its physical layout and its physical infrastructure. Your investment is going to shift to uh, certainly include a lot more in terms of, of the data management and the, the information technology mm -hmm. world. Um, you have to now look at people differently because people who have a shoebox mentality are probably not going to be the future of, uh, of a museum that is focused around five different areas like this. Talk about, the, about that challenge and, and, and how you will be uh, encouraging 
mm -hmm. operationally, that, that mm -hmm. evolution. So it used to be enough to hire a scientist who could do their science, publish papers, and uh, hopefully get grant funding <laughs> to, keep, to keep their right. research going. But you know what? Um, those people with those skills alone are no longer going to be able to thrive in the Natural History Museum of the 21st century. We have to have scientists who want to engage with the public, who understand the relevance of their research to, to contemporary issues, and who will um, be able to maintain their collections in ways that will be able to continue to serve science as we go into the future. One of the important things about maintaining natural history collections is that we cannot predict what the research questions of the future will be. So we are going to be able, we know that we'll develop these extraordinary new technologies. We know that there will be new environmental challenges that face us. And where are you going to find the, the, uh, the, the tools and where are you going to find the, the actual research material to go back and ask those questions? It's in Natural History Museum collections. You know, our museum was involved in, in some of the most fundamental episodes that launched the environmental movement in the 50s and the 60s. Rachel Carson is a native of Pittsburgh. I don't know if you are aware of that. Yeah. And when Rachel Carson first was writing her book, Silent Spring, which of course was the birth of the environmental movement, one of the things that was noticed by people then and, and that got people suspicious about pesticides was that birds of prey all around the world were declining. Right. Their, their reproduction was failing because the eggs were being crushed in the nests. So the theory was, Rachel Carson's theory and, and many others was, that the, that the egg shells were thinner and that the reason they were thinner was because of pollution from DDT. Well, how are you going to prove a theory like that? I mean, how can you prove that the eggshells are thinner than, than they ought to be? Get, get old eggshells. Get old eggshells. <laughs> so you measure the thin eggshells that are crushing in the nests at that time. Then you go, literally, to Carnegie Museum of Natural History, and you measure the thickness of the eggshells that were collected 100 years before there ever was any DDT. And bingo, guess what? By comparing these historical collections to the contemporary eggshells, they proved that the eggshells were so thin that when the birds tried to sit on them, they, were, they would crush. Of course, it was subsequent research that actually showed chemically that it was DDT that was interfering with calcium deposition in the eggs, and that was, you know, that was the reason. Nobody could have predicted that, that 60 years hence, there would be a chemical new in the environment that would result to this question that this collection would be used for. We know that these kind of questions are going to keep coming up, and without the historical collections and the library of information about nature, we're, we, have, we have a unique resource. It's interesting to start to shift the museum from being a place of display or even of, of research to being a place in which economic, the economic future of this country and of indeed of, of the world is actually being researched and plotted. Absolutely. Today, as, as all these efforts of, um, of water quality improvement and habitat restoration are undertaken, so, so, so a, a group or the government or some agency will say, well, let's clean up, you know, Chartier's Creek, all right? And let's, let's, let's bring the native, uh, the native species back to, back to this creek. Well, what's the first thing you need to know? What, what, what used to be there, right? right? The first thing you need to know is what used to be there. Go to Carnegie Museum of Natural History and we'll tell you. We can tell you from our collections exactly what used to be there. These three species used to be there, that one didn't. And so you can know when you've achieved you know, a cleanup and a restoration of that, of that habitat based on the knowledge that we have in our collections. And these things are of Im immense economic importance, you know, because once, once the, the water quality is back and once the native biodiversity is back, then the fisheries are back and then the tourism is back and then the sports are back and then you have a vibrant community again. Talk about how this uh, institution is, is managed. It exists within a constellation of four different Correct. museums. And so you benefit from a, to a certain extent, from a common infrastructure, but you also operate uh, in certain respects as if you were a standalone independent museum. 
Uh, talk about how this, th this functions operationally. Well, Carnegie Museum of Natural History is one of four of the Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh. So the parent organization is, is the Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh. Yes. Uh, this was founded by Andrew Carnegie uh, as the Carnegie Institute back in 1895. And um, at that time, it was just the Carnegie Museum of Natural History and the Carnegie Museum of Art. Um, we are the only museum uh, complex of, of, of our uh, size and stature in the world that was the gift of one individual. I mean, if you look at, if you look at significant museums all around the country and really the world, these were built by the cities or built by the government you know, to serve, to serve a, a, a social benefit. But in Pittsburgh, it was Andrew Carnegie who said, I want to give back to Pittsburgh. I want to give back to the community that all my wealth came from. And he had a very radical philosophy. And before you know, it became fashionable. Before, long before it came, became fashionable. His, his, um, his tome, which is called The Gospel of Wealth, if you read it, is, is absolutely radical um, in its thinking for the day. He strongly defends capitalism and, and that for one individual to accumulate that kind of wealth is the right thing to do. But then he says, you are obligated to give it all away. Before you die, you have to give it all away. So today, you know, you have this, this new pledge that all these billionaires are taking uh, where they sign and they say, I, will, I pledge I'll give away at least half of my wealth before, before I die. That's nothing compared to what Andrew Carnegie actually did. He gave away everything before he died. And we are one of the extraordinary benefactors of that. The Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh, which includes the Natural History Museum, Carnegie Museum of Art, the Carnegie Science Center, and the Andy Warhol Museum, when you look at the combined skills of the staff, the, the combination of our four collections, and, and everything that we have under that one roof, it's really one of the most extraordinary cultural powerhouses in the United States, probably second only to Smithsonian. And we're just learning how to work together. You know, in the past, we've been very siloed and very separate, but, but under new leadership, we're really looking at ways that we can work together to do more interdisciplinary things, to serve Pittsburgh, to reach out to more communities. And, and we have the opportunity to do, uh, to do work that, that really very few organizations can. How does governance work in terms of the board and your various advisory groups? Well, there is a single um, board of trustees for Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh. And they, uh, they, are the, they are the fiduciary board with the actual governing responsibility. But each of the four museums also has an advisory board of directors. About half of, on, on each of the individual museum boards, about half of those members are trustees of Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh. The other half are, are just board members for those museums. And they're there because Obviously, there are people who have a particular passion for one museum or one topic, and so they're there to, um, to both advise but also to help with fundraising. So the elegance of this is that the museums can actually function in ways that, that engage the passions of individual board members and bring in people um, on an advisory basis that are not necessarily part of the overall board. It also binds together each of the museums together between the museums, amongst the museums, and, and with, the, with the full institution. Right. And then you have a, a management infrastructure that reports to you, and you also take advantage of certain uh, shared services. Could you describe uh, the, the infrastructure that, that you manage, right. as well as, as how you interact with the... Each of the four museum directors, and uh, which I am one, are responsible for all the programmatic aspects of their museum. So, so all of the scientists at the Natural History Museum and all the educators, our marketing office, are all managed under the museum. But there are central components for the Carnegie Museums of Pittsburgh that service all four museums. And then in terms of, of how you interact with the community, I, I think it's probably fair to say that you have different constituents than, for example, the Andy Warhol Museum. You have uh, a different relationship with uh, the schools. Um, you have different relationships with uh, the universities. Uh, there are mm -hmm. different community constituents. Sure. How does that function? This is part of our new effort to collaborate so that there's, so that 
we actually would not have four separate relationships with schools and four separate relationships with, with, with the trustees. You know, we're, we're each, you know, kind of competing to get a larger piece of the endowment. By working collaboratively, we really realized that we can accomplish so much more. And so these are, this is, is, is new thinking for us and we're, we're kind of learning how. I would not look back at, you know, how it was five years ago even and say that's how it works. But we really understand that that there are topics that we can take on. You know, we all have certain things in common. We want Pittsburgh to be vibrant economically. We want Pittsburgh to be a kind of place where young people want to stay. Yes. We want we want to participate in the industries that Pittsburgh is 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 growing and unique in. Higher education is one of those. Health services is another one of those. Um, software development and high tech uh, industries are are one of those. There's no reason why all four museums can't be deeply involved in those industries, and and so we're striving to be. You have a, a, an amazing journey to undertake over the next several years, putting into effect these these various uh, parts of your strategic plan. What are your first priorities over the next two years? Sure. Well, um, in the six uh, short six months since we have um, since we have announced this new organization, we have actually launched two of the centers. Uh, we've launched the Center for Biodiversity and Ecosystems, and we've launched the Center for Lifelong Science Learning. Um, in uh, in July of this year, we will be launching the Center for World Cultures and Diversity. Mm. And in that in that short month, uh, six months, we've raised over two and a quarter million dollars for these centers in a pretty tough, you know, economic uh, environment right now. These include um, a, a million dollar gift from the PNC Foundation for the Center for Lifelong Science Learning. Uh, it includes a uh, bequest of a million dollars from the Charles Kaufman Estate. Uh, for the Center for World Cultures and Diversity, and then a major leadership gift from one of my board members for the Center for Biodiversity. So, you know, we're looking to endow each of the centers, and as, the, as, as we get enough money to launch, we will actually hire a director and, and put those centers into place. Um, but it's going to take a lot of fundraising. Yes, yes. I mean, it all does come down to how do you make the ends meet the need um, and, and sustain the institution right. as a very strong and vibrant institution. To be honest, you know, I mean, the, the, the organizational scheme was crafted not only as a necessity in the modern world, but also to create, you know, a structure and, and that, that people would find very interesting and that would be a magnet for funding. Early results look good. Well, thank you so much, Sam, for, for uh, sharing your insights with us. Thank you so much for the leadership that you're bringing to this uh, organization that has always been a leader in its field. My pleasure. Thank it's you. really been nice talking with you.